You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Award from the Lord. Jim's over here with you. I'm so glad you are ready to uh, uh, continue our Bible study together. We uh, appreciate you watching and tuning in, and we hope that you uh, will take advantage of the opportunities that are available to you. Heard Mark uh, saying that he'd be glad to come out and have a Bible study with you. That's a, uh, something that's a standing offer from any uh, member of the Church of Christ. We'll be glad to come out and study God's Word with you. And here's how you can reach me at wordfromthelord at gmail.com, 276 340 2653. Uh, we meet in uh, Eden at 250 the Boulevard, and on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10. And Mark gave the kind of information for uh, Martinsville, Danville, and Eden, and phone numbers. And so uh, uh, this phone number, any, if you'll just call, if you want to know about any of the worship times for uh, any of the churches of Christ in your area, uh, whether it be Martinsville, Danville, or, or Eden, just uh, give us a call. Give somebody a call, and we can point you in the right direction. I mean, it's just that simple. We're easily easy to find, and we hope that we'll, we, you'll find that we're easily uh, uh, accessible to you. And uh, we want you to know we're your friend. We want you to uh, know we appreciate your love of the truth and your interest in God's Word because we have that same desire. Um, I want to continue our Bible study tonight. I want to continue a, a thought that we had a couple weeks ago. Uh, we're dealing with some uh, discussions that we've had with um, individuals in the past and some literature that's been handed to us. But I want to start off this way. Friends, you know, in order to know the mind of God, you have to know the Bible. If you know the Bible, then that's the same as knowing the mind of God. And here's why. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 9, I want you to consider what the Apostle Paul says. 1 Corinthians 2, in verse 9, he says, As it is written, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, that entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Look at verse 10 now. He says, For but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So you won't, don't know anything about God, what, about what's in God's mind, or what he's thinking, anything, except they're revealed by his spirit. Now notice this, verse 12. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, Paul says, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but the which the Holy Ghost teaches is comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul is, t is telling us he has been given the Spirit of God and he's revealing the mind of God. He's revealing the secret things of God, the things that God wants known about him, that he's revealed them to us through his Spirit and through inspired writers like Paul. Now here's the thing. When you're reading words that, <clears throat> that are written down by these men like like the Apostle Paul or Peter or uh, other inspired men, then you can understand what God wants. You can understand God's mind. In Ephesians 3 and verse 4, Ephesians 3 and verse 4, notice this, Paul says, Where, uh, uh, he says, Whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So this is something that was that was uh, hidden, but now it's being revealed. Notice that which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto uh, uh, to his holy apostles and prophets uh, by the Spirit. So if you if you know something that is written by an apostle, someone who's inspired, then you know the mind of God. You know something that he is revealing about himself or about his will. So what we're, what we're trying to get you to realize is this is why it's so important that we understand the Bible, that we study the Bible. Paul said, study to show thyself approved, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. So this is why we're interested in uh, studying the Bible with you because we want to know the mind of God and we want to understand what the will of God is for us. Now, if you deny 
or reject the Bible, then what you're doing is you're denying and rejecting the author of the Bible. You're actually saying that God did not reveal this to himself or that what's written is not really from the mind of God or you're saying that, uh, uh, well, maybe that it came from the mind of man. Now, what this does, friends, this will always get you in trouble. If you deny or reject the Bible, it will always get you in trouble later on down the line, even if you reject part of it. And here's why. Because the sum of God's Word is truth. And it is evident that many times what people do is they want to make a preconceived idea, something they've been taught or something they've seen in a vision or a dream, and they want to make that the truth. And in order to do that, they always have to reject the Bible. Now, I want to uh, uh, go back and uh, let's kind of review some things that we've studied, as we said in uh, a couple of lessons ago. Mr. Don Hopkins has demonstrated the very thing we're talking about. Rejecting even part of God's Word will always get you into trouble because what he's doing, he's trying to force the Bible to conform to his beliefs rather than make his beliefs conform to the Bible. And that'll always get you in trouble. It will always, you'll always find that you're contradicting yourself coming and going when you start eliminating and, re and removing part of God's Word. Now, one of the things that we have shown from Mr. Hopkins is what he has said about the Bible. Now, I want to lay this out for you again because to me it's the, it's the groundwork. It's like the, the foundation. It is the, it is the key element to understanding what this man is teaching. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because, as I said a couple weeks ago, he uh, sent me a five-page letter and he sent this book uh, um, to me and I've I reviewed it and I've highlighted and, and marked in it and made uh, comments and so forth in it and I've shown you, shown you uh, uh, some excerpts from it uh, here on the program. And this is what I'm saying. When you start trying to conform the Bible to your beliefs, you will always have trouble. And the only solution to try to make your doctrine or your belief fit is to, is to uh, downgrade or minimize, marginalize the Bible. And that's what Mr. Hopkins has done. I want to remind you what he has said about the Bible. Now, individuals who are watching this program, I think most of them appreciate the Bible. Most of them have a high regard for the Bible and will hold it in high, high esteem and respect. But it always is the case, friends, and it's not just Mr. Hopkins, but anybody, anybody who loses respect for the Word of God is eventually going to start cutting it out like, uh, like Jehoiakim did and just take a little pen knife and cut it out and throw it in the fire. Now, I'm not saying Mr. Hopkins has cut out the Bible, but he basically has by the things he says. Now, notice again. Let's just review a little bit. This is what he said on page um, uh, 69 of this little book. He says that the New Testament writers were wrong. The New Testament writers were wrong. Now, friends, does that not just send up a red flag and say, wait a minute. This guy is saying the New Testament writers were wrong, but yet he's trying to tell us that we should be reading and studying the Bible? Uh, as a matter of fact, notice, notice the contradiction here. The New Testament writers are wrong. Uh, let me pull this one up here. Now, listen to what he says on page 134. Now, that's that page 69. He said the New Testament writers are wrong. He says, the teachings of Christ are true. The King James Bible is a true record of Christ's teaching. All right, so he's trying to separate Christ's teachings from the rest of the Bible, you might say. But last week we showed, or last time we showed, that he doesn't even accept all of Christ's teachings, all right? But he wants to say the King, you need to study the King James Bible. Constantly he's telling us in this little book, we need to study the King James Bible. We need to study the King James Bible. But then he turns around and says things like this, like the New Testament writers are wrong. Well, I don't know if you've paid attention to this, friends. I don't know if Mr. Uh, um, uh, Hopkins has paid attention to this, but most of the New Testament is not Christ's direct words. I mean, if you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, you'll find that the majority of the New Testament is not written in red. It is not the actual words of Christ. It is the New Testament writer. So Mr. Hopkins then has to go back and pick and choose which is true. Now notice, here's something else he said. He said, everything in the Bible is not Scripture. 
Now, friends, you see the problem we're having? Everything in the Bible is not Scripture. Listen, I will submit to you that everything in the Bible is inspired of God. Now, that doesn't mean everything in the Bible is a truth because the devil is recorded as saying some things in the Bible. But it is a, an inspired and accurate uh, 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 quote of what Satan said. So are Satan's words inspired? No. But the writing of them are what's inspired. Does that make sense? Do you see that? So when you're reading through Genesis and you read that you read the uh, the serpent came and he deceived Eve and what he said to him, you know, you will not be God's, that's not true. But it is truly recorded. It is an accurate recording of what took place. It is inspired. And so in that sense, all of these words are inspired. This is inspired word of God. Mr. Hopkins, everything in the Bible is not inspired. Everything, or excuse me, everything in the Bible is not scripture. Now see, that's a problem, friends. Everything in the Bible is Scripture. This is Scripture because it came from the mouth of God. It came from the mind of God. It's inspired. That is, it is God-breathed, and therefore it is Scripture because God had it recorded and preserved for us. And Mr. Hopkins says things like, it's an error to say God said something when really Peter, Mark, or Luke said it. Well, we've demonstrated this uh, uh, last time we were on, we demonstrated this, the fact that the Bible is written by the penman of men. In other words, God used men as the penman, but the Holy Spirit was guiding them to write these things. So, uh, again, what Mr. Hopkins is doing, he's trying to eliminate all the problem verses that he has that contradict his doctrine so that he can fit the doctrine into the Bible. Now, I find it very, very hypocritical for a man to say, you need to study this book, you need to study this book, you need to read the King James Bible, and then turn around and say, but everything in it's not scripture, everything in it's not right, some of those guys are wrong, some of those guys are wrong, and the way he tells us he's wrong is by his dreams and his, his uh, premonitions and his visions that he sees and uh, the, uh, the, the warm, fuzzy feelings, I guess, that he, that he has. Friends, I'm not going to trust Mr. Hopkins with my soul. I'm going to trust the Bible. But he goes on to say things like this. Paul was wrong. Paul was wrong. Peter was wrong. Now, friends, my whole point is this. This is what happens when a man is trying too hard to find out or to make something true that's not true. Now, what Don Hopkins has done is what many people do. And that is he has basically put himself in a position where he has to deny the Bible in order to get his belief right. And that will always lead him to believe something that's not true. This is what Don Hopkins believes about the Bible. It's not, it's not all true. He doesn't believe that it's all Scripture. He doesn't believe that the New Testament writers are right. He doesn't believe that Peter and, and uh, Paul are right, that they're inspired. Uh, in, in what they wrote. He says some of the things they wrote are, are opinions and so forth. And it always going to get him to this, plot, this spot. And that is to rest the scriptures or twist it. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 2 Peter 3 verse 15. Look what he says. He says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him. Now, let's stop for a minute. Peter says that Paul was given wisdom. Now, Mr. Hopkins was just given a dream. He was given a vision. Peter said Paul was inspired. He was given wisdom. You know what? I, I believe what Peter said, and therefore I don't believe what Paul said. He said, as the wisdom given unto him, Hath, hath written unto you, Paul has written to you by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that was given him, and he says, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, as they do, uh, uh, rest, as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. See, friends, when you start saying that Peter didn't write or Peter didn't know what he's talking about, Paul was wrong, Mark was wrong, Mark just wrote something he heard somebody say 
Luke wrote something he heard somebody say, somebody said, and, and so forth, and deny the inspiration of the Bible, you're going to get to this point right here where you're actually twisting and resting scriptures, and it will lead to your own destruction. Now, last time we talked about some things that, um, that Mr. Hopkins believed, and basically just focused on what he uh, believed about the Bible. But I, tonight I want to continue some of the things that I thought were found very, very shocking and even, even disturbing that Mr. Hopkins said. Notice this. Again, this is page 69 of his book. He said, Jesus did not want to save everyone. Jesus did not want to save everyone. Can you imagine that? Jesus, the Savior of the world, does not want to save everybody. Now, that's what Mr. Hopkins says. That's what the Primitive Baptist says. Primitive Baptist Don Hopkins says. Jesus didn't, didn't, he didn't want to save everybody. He didn't want to save everybody. He didn't, love, he didn't love man enough to die for their sins. No, Jesus didn't want to save everybody. Can you just on the face of that, friends, without even going to the Scripture, to, to, to show the error. Just think about that. Mr. Hopkins wants us to believe in his little book that he had to deny the Bible to write that Jesus did not want to save everybody. All the agony, the suffering, the anguish, the pain that he went through. And he said, well, you know what? I, I'm not going to save everybody. I don't want to save everybody. I want to die on the cross. I want to have... Thorns placed up on my head. I'm going to have a, a robe put on my back and ripped off so that the wounds open up. I'm going to be beaten, scourged, mocked, spit upon, crucified, but not for everybody. I'm going to go through it, but I don't want to go through it for everybody. See, I don't want to go through all that trouble for everybody. See how silly that is, friends? But listen. Again, remember, when we show you the Bible, you have to think, all right, in order for Mr. Hopkins to say this, he has to reject these scriptures. In Luke 19 and verse 10, Luke 19 and verse 10, Jesus said, the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. Now, Mr. Hopkins will say, well, that doesn't mean he's going to save everybody. He just came to save a certain lost people. Well, wait a minute. Are they really lost? How can they be lost? If they're all children of God, I'm getting ahead of myself. He came to save a certain kind of lost person, I guess. Well, what do you do with 1 John 2? What do you do with 1 John 2? Let's look at this. Got a phone line coming in. A phone call. Let me see here. 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you, that ye sin not, and if any man sin, he have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world. All right. <clears throat> the whole world. Jesus is a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. Now, friends, who do you think that excludes? Mr. Hopkins said Jesus didn't want to save everybody. He didn't want to save everybody, but John, John must, see, John must not know this. See, this is how Mr. Hopkins rationalizes. He says, well, if it contradicts what I believe, Jesus didn't want to save everybody, then John must be wrong. John didn't know what he's talking about. But friends, I'm going to take John. I'm going to take John the apostle. You know why? Because John says in chapter 1, John chapter 1, you know what he says? 1 John chapter 1, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, that which was with the Father, and was manifested unto you, that which we have seen <coughs> and heard, declare we unto you, that ye may have fellowship, that ye may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You know what? The Apostle John said, we saw Christ. We heard Christ. We, we, we looked upon Him. We, we touched Him. 
And now we're bearing witness to you of the things that we have seen and heard. And we're declaring that unto you. So when he declares to us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2 that everybody can benefit from the death of Christ, that he is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, I'm going to reject Mr. Hopkins. But let's look at another one. Let's look at another one. In 1 John, let's stay in 1 John. 1 John 4 and verse 14. 1 John 4, 14. We have seen and do testify uh, that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now what world are we talking about here, Mr. Hopkins? Was John wrong on this point? The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world? I mean, I mean how do you, how do you, uh, uh, um, you know, narrow that down to just a few persons? How, I mean, how do you rule out some people here? Let's look at another one, 1 John. We're still in 1 John, chapter 5, verse 19. And I know he likes 1 John because he quotes 1 John, he quotes 1 John 5 and verse 1 to say that you're saved at the point of belief. If you believe, you got God. If you believe, you're born of God, therefore John must be right. Well, let's come on down uh, uh, 19 verses later. I'm sorry that. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, now, what, now, if Jesus came to save the whole world, what world? The whole world lying in wickedness? See, Mr. Hopkins is going to say, no, Jesus didn't come to save the whole world because they're wicked. But John, in the same book, says he, he's the Savior of the whole world, and then he says, and the whole world lies in wickedness. Therefore, Christ must have been purposed to come to die for the sins of the whole wicked world. Now, who does that exclude? Who does that exclude? First John, or excuse me, John, just John, Chapter 1, verse 29. John the baptizer said of Jesus, the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Which world? Just a little bitty, a few chosen, elect? Who, who, uh, uh, who was it that Christ came to die for? He didn't want to save everybody? Really? That's not what the Bible is saying. John 4 and verse 42. And he said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because... Uh, now, uh, and, then, and then said, and said unto the woman, uh, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's what the, the people of Samaria said about Christ. He's the Savior of the world. Oh, well, see, they were, just, they were just spouting that off. So, you know, these folks weren't inspired. That's, that's not really scripture, I guess, since it didn't come from Christ himself. What is it, Mr. Hopkins? Who, who's the world that Christ came to save? And who specifically are the people that Christ doesn't want to save? See? What part of, uh, what part of the whole world is excluded here? What part of the Savior of the whole world excludes someone? Tell me who. Who's excluded here? In, in Hebrews 5 and verse 9, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, notice this. <clears throat> Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That, that all, all of who? All of anybody in the world? Anybody in the world who will obey Christ He'll become their Savior. He's the author of salvation to all that will obey Him. Now you want to narrow it down to just a few people, I guess. But why is that? Why is that when, when the Bible says Jesus came, became the Savior of the whole world? And think about this, friends. Think about this. In Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, I know Mr. Hopkins doesn't like this verse. 
I know he doesn't like this verse. Most, most Baptists don't. Uh, but look at this. He said unto them, now Jesus is talking to his apostles, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he believeth not shall be damned. Now, if Jesus didn't want to save everybody, why would he then tell his apostles to go and preach to everybody? Why would, why would he need to tell them to go preach the gospel to every creature knowing that he wasn't going to save them? I, I don't really want to save that person, So, but go waste your time talking to him. You see, if the apostles were inspired, which again, we see that Mr. Hopkins doesn't really believe that they were truly inspired, but surely Jesus could tell them and, and direct them in some way to talk to just the people that he wanted to save. I mean, wouldn't that save more time? Wouldn't that be more efficient? God is a very efficient God. So uh, wouldn't it be more practical to say, well, go and preach the gospel just to the people that I'm going to save because those other people out there, I'm not going to save them. Jesus only wants to save a few people. Really? Is that really the kind of Savior that you have, my friend? That's the kind of Savior Mr. Hopkins has. He, 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 has, he, he talks about Christ being, um, you know, really a kind of a cruel Savior. I don't really want to save everybody. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believe in him should not perish. Well, that whosoever is not really whosoever. Not just anybody. Just a certain group of people. Because see, here's what Mr. Hopkins says. Mr. Hopkins says, well, there's just a predestined group of people. See, just, a, just an elect people. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't have this uh, scanned in for you to uh, read the quote here, but see if I can find it uh, for you. Don't know if I can find it that quickly. Here it is. Uh, he says... This is on page 40, and he's talking about salvation by grace. And he says that uh, those that are saved by grace have been predestinated. And he says Ephesians 1, verse 5. And, he, and uh, actually, he, he quotes it, uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Let's put that up here, Ephesians 1 and verse 5. Ephesians 1 and verse 5 having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Now, friends, does that say that only a certain group of people are predestined? It just says, it just says that individuals are predestinated unto the adoption of children. See, what that's talking about, that's talking about the plan. God predetermined, he predestined that in order to be saved, you have to be adopted. But look at verse 4. See, go back and read the verse according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That doesn't say that a certain group of people are predestined. That's just saying that the people who are saved have been chosen in Christ. Only the people that are in Christ are going to be saved. God predestined a plan not the man, not the person who's going to be saved, but the plan by which that man will be saved. That's what God planned all before. Not just a certain group of people, but rather a way in which all people might be saved. He predestined, predestined them to be saved in Christ, in his body, which Paul says in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 is, is the church. Now, Mr. Hopkins doesn't seem to, he doesn't seem to want to serve a, a, a loving God and loving Savior that wants to save everybody. He, Jesus only want, uh, he says Jesus only came to save a uh, few people, not everybody. He didn't come to save everybody. Well, that's the, kind of, that's the kind of Christ you want. Mr. Hopkins, you can have him. I'm going to stick with the Christ I read about in the Bible. But see, here's why Mr. Hopkins would say that about Jesus. Because he says this. He says this. Now, this is from, uh, uh, let's see. I didn't put the page up here. 
I want to make sure I'm getting it right. Not that you'll be reading this book probably. I don't recommend you wasting your money. But <clears throat> just to show you that, he, that I am uh, getting it from his book and not attributing something to him that, that's not true. Let's see, Matthew... I want to say that's about page, well, I don't know. I'm spending all my time. Say, uh, here it is, page 37. Page 37. Matthew 13, 36 to 39. Jesus did not come to save children of the devil. Jesus didn't come to save children of the devil. He only came to save children of God. So you've got, according to Mr. Hopkins, I guess, you've got two groups of lost people. You've got the lost children of God and you've got the lost children of the devil. And the lost children of the devil, they don't have any hope. Jesus didn't come to save them. He only came to save the lost children of God. <clears throat> now, how's the person lost? See, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out now how, how's a person lost? What makes a person a child of the devil? What makes a person lost? How is a child of God lost? Well, a child of God is lost when he sins. Well, what is the child of the devil then? Look, Jesus said in John 8, 34. Sorry about that. John 8 and verse 34. Go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt, if you don't mind. Jesus uh, answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, friends, can a, can a child of God be the servant of sin? Can you, be a, can you be a servant of sin and a child of God? Can you be letting sin reign in your heart and be a child of God? I mean, is, is that what we're talking about here? Fr free from sin? Now, now, Mr. Hobbs is going to say, well, you, you can be, a, I guess, a servant of sin, but you still be a child of God. I don't understand the difference. I don't understand how he makes the distinction here. Jesus didn't come to save the children of the devil. Well, what does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 2? Look at this, Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, that has to be talking about children of God, obviously, because he says they've qu been quickened. But yet he says they were dead in trespasses and sin. Now, were they child of the devil or were they children of God? Which was it? Were they children of the devil or children of God? He says, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Is that a child of God, child of God or a child of the devil? according to the prince of the power of the air. I'm pretty sure that's the devil. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What? A child of disobedience has been, has been quickened out of their sins and trespasses? You mean to tell me a child of God was walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now were the children of disobedience? Seems to me that there's not much difference between the child of the devil and the child of God then, Mr. Hopkins. So how do you know the difference? Christ didn't come to save the children of the devil? Seems to me that everybody who commits sin is serving the devil. Yet some of those people who are serving sin are going to come out of that. Now, Mr. Hobbs is going to say, well, those are really children of God. Well, they all look the same to me. They all, they all look out there sinning. Verse, verse 3, he said, Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Now, Mr. Hopkins, how do you tell the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil? They all start the same way, it looks like. Looks like they all start the exact same way. Verse 4, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, 
even when we were dead in sins, <clears throat> were we dead in sins as children of God or dead in sins as children of the devil? Hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. So, these folks that are saved by grace, were they children of the devil to start with or children of God? If they're children of God, you've got them serving the devil. I'd like to know how that works. How is it Christ did not come to save children of the devil? I submit to you, friends, that Christ came to save children of the devil. He came to save them from the devil. He came to get them to stop following and obeying their father, the devil, and become adopted children of God by obedience to the gospel. Every person who sins is a child of the devil. But see, Mr. Hopkins has a problem because he has to have, he, he, he doesn't have a person doing anything in their salvation. God has to save them. So he has to make a distinction between somebody who's over here lost, walking accord, according to the course of the world, following their flesh, uh, uh, giving into their lust, following the children of disobedience, the same spirit of the children of disobedience working in them. He has to have those individuals being a child of God because God is then going to pick them and save them. I guess only God can tell the difference. He looks down and sees all these people walking according to the lust of their flesh and, and uh, according to the, the spirit of disobedience. Living in their lust and desires. And he said, oh, well, yeah, that's one of my child right there. You, you can't see him, but see, he, that's my child. <clears throat> Looks like a child of the devil. Oh, no, 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 he's not a child of the devil. Well, according to Mr. Hopkins, he's not. But I submit to you, God came, uh, uh, God devised a plan, sent his son to save all who will obey him from being children of the devil. He came to save children of the devil. Now, Mr. Hopkins, you want, you want to serve a God that wants to pick and choose. That's, I guess that's uh, something you're going to live with. But, friends, I'm going to say the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't know such a distinction between, uh, or doesn't, and, uh, between the child of God and child of the devil from the beginning when, they're <clears throat> all, when we've all walked in sin. So what makes a person a child of the devil? I mean, 1 John... 3 and verse 8. 1 John 3 and verse 8. He that commit a sin is of the devil. Well, there you go. Paul said they were committing sin. Paul said those folks in, the, in Ephesus, he writing to the folks at Ephesus, he said, you were once committing sin. Well, that must be that means you're children of the devil. How is it they were saved? How in the world were they saved? Committing sin or children of the devil? For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Oh, no, Jesus didn't come to save children of the devil, Mr. Hopkins says. Well, John says differently. Again, I'm going to take John on this. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean he wasn't once, was, wasn't once a child of the devil. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Verse 10. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, wait a minute. Mr. Hopkins says you don't do anything. You don't do anything for your salvation. You don't have any choice in the matter. It's all up to God which leads us to another point in just a minute. You see, friends, you see how, you see the, the tangled web that you get into when you start trying to twist a doctrine like Calvinism, which is what Mr. Hopkins is, is dealing with here, hyper-Calvinism, man-made doctrine. You have to start pulling out, weeding out, cutting out parts of the Bible in order to get your doctrine to fit. Listen to this. 
<clears throat> you might not can read this. I'll read it to you. He says, We are saved by grace without our efforts. The Bible does teach works of righteousness, but these are works, but these works are for the children of God to do as children, not to become children. So nothing you do to become a child of God. God has to look down and just pick and choose you as a child. Even though you look just like the children of the devil because you're doing the same things. I'd like for Mr. Hopkins to call in and tell us, how do you know the difference between a child of the devil and a child of, child of God? When they all look the same in the beginning. He's going to say they're all born in sin. He doesn't like that term, but does he, Mark? Sinful nature. But it's the same thing. Inherited, inherited this sinful nature from Adam. To what he said. So, so here's my question. How is a child of God born in sin or at least guilty of sin when they're born and still be a child of God? But a child of the devil is born the same way and is condemned to hell. Now, how, how can you tell the difference? How can you tell the difference? Let me tell you something, friends. Jesus did not come to die for a predetermined, predestined number of individuals, a chosen few. But when you deny the Bible, then you wind up blaming God for all the people who are lost. Now, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. If you ask me, it's pretty bad for Mr. Hobson to come out and say Jesus did not want to save Everybody. Jesus didn't want to save everybody. It's what he says. And then he says, you know, Jesus did not, didn't come to save children of the devil. That's pretty bad. <coughs> That's a pretty, I'd say a blasphemous statement right there. But it gets worse. It gets worse. It gets more outrageous, more outlandish. Listen to what he's going to say. Mr. Hopkins says that God decides who comes to Christ. Christ doesn't want to save everybody. And then God chooses who comes to Christ to be saved. So it's bad enough that Christ doesn't want to save everybody. I mean, it'd be one thing if you're saying, yeah, Christ wants to save everybody, but God says, no, you're only going to save these certain people. But instead of, instead of making a Christ a a cruel and unloving and unjust and, and, and wicked Savior, now he makes God a co-conspirator, you might say, to man's destruction, man's eternal damnation. He says, God decides who comes to Christ. Listen to what he says. This is what he says. Now, this is um, in, uh, in his letter that he wrote, and I believe this is from page two. I'm just going to pull it out here and make sure I can read it. <clears throat> he says, John 6, 44. John 6, 44. I'm going to pull this up for you. John 6, verse 44. He says, No man can come to me except my Father which sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now here's Mr. Hopkins' quote. He says, if no man can come to Christ except God draws him, who makes the choice for you to come to Christ? If God does not draw you to Christ, who decides if you're lost? Now, he's making that a statement instead of a question. He's asking as a question, but it's a period on his comment there. So I don't know if that, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's supposed to be a question. He's asking this question. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is God. If no man come to Christ except God draws them, who makes the choice for you to come to Christ? Well, it has to be God. If God does not draw you to Christ, who decides if you're lost? Well, it has to be God. Everywhere in the Bible where salvation is taught, the action is always God's action. So, Mr. Hopkins is telling us that if a man is lost, it's because God does not draw him, God does not want him to be saved. If he's lost, it's because God says, you're going to be lost. You're going to be lost. 
even though we, even though the the Bible tells us that God doesn't want everybody to be lost. God doesn't want everybody to be lost. Now, Paul said God would have all men to be saved come to knowledge of the truth, and Mr. Hopkins says Paul got that wrong. <laughs> See what I'm talking about, friends? You say, uh, well. God would have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And Mr. Hopkins says, uh, well, that's uh, that, that's really not true. Paul doesn't know what he's talking about here. First Timothy two, uh, First Timothy uh, two three. This is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. <laughs> Paul's wrong about that. So what are we doing, Mr. Hopkins? Well, here's a verse that contradicts what I believe, so Paul's wrong. Because Mr. Hopkins had a dream, so Paul's wrong. Mr. Hopkins saw a horse riding up a mountain, so, so Paul's wrong. Mr. Hopkins had a dream about a mountain of fairy stones, so Paul's wrong. See what we're talking about, friends? It's really sad. It's really sad that this is what we're coming to, but to say that man is lost because God does not want him to be saved. When the Bible clearly says God would have all men to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. God, no, uh, let's look at this, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Three, nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I guess that's all there is just a, a certain select group of people. <clears throat> but friends, think about this. If that's still just a group of people, a certain group of people, if that's just all of a certain group of people, you mean some of them could perish? Even if Mr. Hopkins says, well, this is just a limited, this is limited to the elect, the people that God's going to say, well, they still have to come to repentance. He's not willing that any of them should perish, but yet somehow they could be. He's not willing for them to perish, but yet they could be, they could perish. So you mean even among the ones that God chooses to save, some of them still won't be saved. Well, whose choice is that? God chose them to be saved, but then he chose for them not to be saved? Oh, what a tangled web we weave. As the saying goes, when we, what, attempt to deceive? Mr. Hopkins so much wants for Calvinism, this man made doctrine to be true, that he actually makes God a God who would condemn someone just because I chose for them to be lost. Here again, he says, this is, he says, if you study Bible, the Bible diligently, you will find many scriptures to establish that we are saved by grace. I don't have any problem with that. Saved by grace. But then he says, without our efforts. Prince, what are we doing? What are we doing here? Why is it, why is it that man would even study God's word? Why even give, why even give man a book? Why would God even give man this book and have Paul say, study to show thyself approved unto God? Or have Peter say in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why, why would God have uh, man to write these things uh, down and, and say that, that what we should do is add to our faith virtue and the virtue knowledge? 2 Peter 1 and verse 5. Why add knowledge if, if you can't do anything about it? If you're, if you're arbitrarily going to be saved or lost. How does Mr. Hopkins know that he's saved? 
I don't think he does. I, I, I challenge, I defy Mr. Hopkins to, to tell us how he knows he's saved. If God arbitrarily chooses someone to be saved and lost. Now he's going to say, well, I had a dream. Well, whoop de doo I had a dream too. Well, you know what? I just learned not to eat pizza late at night. See what we're talking about, friends? Why, why do you spend your time preaching and studying if it's all up to God? You're on the word from the Lord. Uh, good evening. Um, um, I was wondering, I uh, seen where you said that uh, uh, he had, uh, when the, uh, God wants, I never have read in the Bible where God wants anything uh, or needs anything. But uh, and I see in his writing in the book there that he said he said he wants the Lord wants or God wants. Do you know of any place in the Bible where he wants anything? He's got it all where I look read it. Well, but I wonder. Well, I, I know. I mean, God doesn't need anything from us, but He would have. You know, He does want us to. Uh, you know, act a certain way toward him or he wants us to, uh, you know, ask him, pray for him. I mean, he does want some things from us, but not because he needs it. Does that make sense? He doesn't want anything from us because think, he needs it. I think that's what you're getting at, but uh, no one, uh, Don, uh, Don, yeah, Don's brothers and everything, he's got about five brothers. I wonder if they all believe the same thing he believes. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to say, I'm going to say uh, that Don is pretty, uh, uh, he, he's in pretty much of a minority on what he believes, wouldn't you say? You, you know him? You know him? Uh, that, yeah, I know him. Uh, he's been in first homes for years. And, right. Uh, I've never been first homes myself and so on. Yeah, I know him. Right. Uh, but, uh, but now, uh, now he is now. It don't sound like him, like the Don I thought I knew uh, in his work, writings there, but I don't know who yeah. he's trying to appeal to. But uh, uh, it just don't sound like him. Now he now in in his book, uh, and he's he's come by and left us booklets before and said if everybody read his his book or whatever they'd all be primitive Baptist. So is that are we am I correct in saying that he's a primitive Baptist? Do you know that much about him? Yeah, that's that's the uh, order of uh, belief he follows. Yeah. Do you know Do you know where he worships? I mean, does he? Is there a primitive Baptist up there in Stewart where he worships? Or uh, they all over the place. I don't know exactly which one he he might attend. Uh, uh, but uh, the way I read it, the, the only place that I can remember where it says, "Depart from me, you workers of iniquity." I never knew you. Uh, so I, I don't know if he's referring to that in his remarks or not, but uh, uh, that's, that's you're pretty close to what what I believe you should be speaking. Right. But, uh, it right. just, uh, that's the only place I can think of it. Yeah. In our, well, it like I said, like I said, God doesn't want anything of us because he needs it, but he does you know, he, he, he does want us to obey him. I mean, that's his will for us. So, uh, uh -huh. uh, anyway, well, I appreciate your call. I appreciate your call. Uh, yes, sir. Now, you, Thank you. Now, where where are you calling evening. from? Where are you calling from? Where are you, where are you, are you in Stewart or Martinsville? Where are you calling from? Guess he's gone. Okay. <clears throat> but anyway, okay, so there's someone who, who knows Mr. Hopkins and, uh, you know, that, that's what we're saying. There's a lot of strange, strange doctrines uh, floating around. And, uh, but it all because man chooses to ignore what the Bible says and try to develop his own, try to develop his own uh, 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 doctrine here. So another question is, why is Don writing letters? Why is he writing a book? If God is doing all the choosing in this, <clears throat> there's no way, friends, there's no way that... I'm going to get anything from this letter unless God wants me to get something from this letter. And Mr. Hopkins, he's, he's chastising me, you know, in this letter. 
But he says in his book and in his letter that only God can do it. So why, why are you chastising me? Why am I the bad guy? He says, I will try to explain, uh, I'll try again to explain my position on salvation and how we receive it. I doubt you can understand the Bible truth. Well, if I can't, it's God's fault. You said it. You are so confused about the Bible. Well, because God made me that way. Uh, he said, uh, I, I don't know, there's some, uh, there's some other uh, uh, little snide remarks he makes here in this letter, but my, my, the Primitive Baptists protest Sunday schools, missionaries, note singing, so they were called Primitive Baptists. I think Mark covered this uh, last time, but uh, my, my point is, why write this letter? Save paper, man, you know? Save, save paper, save energy, save ink. Why write this book? No one can understand this book, Mr. Hopkins. No one can understand the scriptures you put in this book. Unless God, God helps them. And God's already written a book, so do you think that writing your book is going to help people understand God's book? Say, it just doesn't make any sense, friends. No sense whatsoever. Now, God is the, uh, well, I'm, I'm really about out of time. <clears throat> um, I'm going to cover this one more here. Mr. Hopkins says this. Don, Don Hopkins says, he says, baptism is for church membership, not salvation. Church membership, not salvation. Well, you know what, friends? The Bible says both. The Bible says it's for both. In Acts 2, verse 41, Acts 2, verse 38, actually it says, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. What was baptism for? For the remission of sins? Salvation. I believe salvation is for the remission, is remission of sins. He said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And look at this. Verse 41 says, uh, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. Why? For the mission of sins. And then what happened? Verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So what's the order here? They repented, they believed, and were baptized for the mission of sins, and they were added to the church. The Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. Salvation Baptism is for salvation and to put you in Christ, which is in his body, where salvation is. Friends, I'm out of time, but I want to uh, leave you with this. You know, this content information, if you would want to contact me and study the Bible, be glad to do that, 276-340-2653, wordmelord.gmail.com. If you, uh, you know, know Mr. Hopkins, tell him we've been talking about his, uh, his book, reviewing his book, uh, critiquing his book, trying to show where it's, so contrary to the Bible. But friends, you don't have to take a man's word for it and don't believe that God is, is rejecting you. All you have to do is believe the Bible. It's inspired word of God. Obey it. And uh, you'll, uh, you'll be a child of God and saved from your sins. We're out, we're out of time, so I'm going to close off. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. You're traveling to another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop, 